Well, good evening to each one. We're glad you're here. Hope that your afternoon has been a good one. And we're glad that we can be together tonight for our worship services. I will go ahead and mention that this coming Tuesday, we will meet for our Golden Alkires. Some were wondering, I guess I was wondering, if we would have it the week of Thanksgiving. And uh, the class said, yeah, we want to have it, so we're going to. So if you can come and be with us, um, you don't even have to be a Golden Alkire. You could just come and be a part of this good Bible study. But we meet at uh, 10 o'clock on Tuesday mornings. And we'd encourage you to come and be with us. And I do know that this week is a week that uh, our country celebrates Thanksgiving. And uh, that means a lot of things to folks. It means some football and some good food and some good family. And I imagine that some of you are going to be traveling or will have loved ones who are traveling. Let's just keep each other in our prayers and pray that all will have safe trips to their destinations and then, then back to their destinations as well. But we do have so much to be thankful for, and I'm glad that we can have uh, days like that. I hope as Christians we realize that we're thankful every day for the blessings that our God gives to us. But uh, you be careful this week if you are going to be traveling. I want to share some thoughts with you tonight that I don't know if you've heard before. I know that you have not heard them from the media because these are some ideas that well, the world doesn't want you to know. I want to share with you tonight evidence for a young earth. I really believe this is an important study for us. We're going to take a couple of weeks to do this because there is so much evidence for us to examine. But it's an important study because really the, the trustworthiness of the Bible depends on this. If someone were to ask me, how do you think this universe was created? My answer would simply be to go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God is our creator and he created all things. Psalm 19 and verse 1 tells us, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. And so the Bible makes this declaration that God is the creator of all things. The universe is a thing. God is its creator. And He did it just like the Bible tells us He did. He spoke it into existence, creating all things in six literal days. Folks, that's what the Bible declares to us in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. And look in Exodus 20 and verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. He created all things in six days. Now, I know we live in a world that wants to try and tell us, no, 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 you, you don't understand. We know that this universe is 15 to 20 billion years old. We know that this earth is about 4.6 billion years old. There is no way that God created this universe in six days. So there are some who try to, to try to put the two together. How can we put the Bible and the thoughts of the evolutionists, the atheists, together when it comes to this universe? Well... Maybe in Genesis 1 or Genesis, there are huge gaps of time. And that's where we get these billions of years. Or maybe those six days weren't literal days. They were long periods of time. Maybe each one represents a million years. Folks, do you realize that still doesn't get you close to 15, 20 billion years? Not even in the ballpark. 
the atheist would just laugh at you. Man has come up with this idea of theistic evolution. And I even hear sometimes people say things like, well, couldn't God have done it that way? Couldn't He have used evolution to create all things? I suppose He could if He wanted to do it that way. But He didn't. So why ask if He could? He didn't. Someone told me one time that theistic evolution is about like grape nuts. Grape nuts are neither grape nor nuts. And there is nothing theistic about theistic evolution. It just won't work. And the evolutionists will laugh at you with coming up with something like that. And so really, we, we have a, a dilemma here. The Bible declares that God made all things and that He did it not too long ago. You know, the, the evolutionists will say man hasn't been here upon the earth that long. The earth may be 4.6 billion years, but man, he's only been here about 3 million years. That's, that's just a drop in the bucket. That's not what the Bible says. In Matthew chapter 19 and verse 4, Jesus said, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? He made man and woman on day six. At the beginning, not way, 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 way down that road. And so you have those who try to argue for these extended periods of time and those that will argue, like us, that the earth is relatively young. And by relatively young, I mean about six to 10,000 years old. No more than 10,000. I really think it's more about 6,000 years old when you look at the evidence given in the Scriptures. Now, when we come to the evidence, we realize that the evolutionists and the creationists, they have the same evidence. It's the same universe. But it certainly is interpreted Differently, The evolutionists will say the universe is 15 to 20 billion years old. The earth is 4.6 billion years old. I thought this was interesting. When Darwin came out with his theory, he said that the earth was about 30 million years old. Folks, the earth got a whole lot older in those hundred or so years. And you know why? Because the evolutionist believes the key to every possibility is time. Given enough time, anything can happen. Someone asked the question, why can't we see something transitioning from one form to another? It's because, the evolutionist says, it takes so much time. Time is their miracle. And they will argue more stringently about this matter of how old the universe is or how old the earth is than just about anything. Because if you take away that amount of time from them, they don't think they've got enough time for their theory to fit. Well, it won't fit no matter what amount of time you give them. But that's, that's what they try to say. Creationist says the universe and the earth are about 6,000 years old. Now, we talked about this a little bit a week or so ago, but we know the evolutionist, the atheist, likes to champion the thought of a big bang. That's how the universe started, according to them. But it starts out with two contradictions to science. Number one, you have created matter. Who made it? How'd you get the matter to start with? I don't have an answer for that. And you have the uh, problem of developing order out of chaos. When you have an explosion, how often does it create something that works? How often does it create something that is functional? It just doesn't happen. You know, you can't have, a, can't have a, an explosion in a print shop and the fire people come and they put out everything and they say, look, we found four books that were created by this explosion. It doesn't work that way. And so you have this problem with their thinking. One of their cronies, 
Paul Davies, an evolutionist, said in his book entitled The Edge of Infinity, the Big Bang represents the instantaneous suspension of physical laws, the sudden abrupt flash of lawlessness that allowed something to come out of nothing. It represents a true miracle. I wonder if it was hard for him to write that word miracle. I do believe that this universe was created by miracle. Not by some Big Bang that happened because of nothing. I'm not very smart, but I know that when you start with nothing, you still end up with nothing. But that's what he says happened. The miracle is that God spoke this universe into existence. And my friends, ask yourself, which one's more reasonable? That nothing created the universe or an almighty God created it? The evolutionists want you to believe that nothing created everything that we have. I thought this was interesting too. You know, you watch a lot of programs that tell us about the universe. Try to explain it to us the best that we can with the limited knowledge that we have. Man claims that 96% of the universe is made up of dark matter and dark energy. But notice this. These are things that we know nothing about and we have never observed or measured dark matter or dark energy. I don't know about you, but if you miss 96% on a test, if you don't know 96% of a subject, I wouldn't call you an expert. And yet, here are these experts telling us all about the universe with their speculation. It's Psalm 147 in verse 4 and 5, we're told, He telleth the number of the stars, He calleth them all, by their names. 100 billion stars in 100 billion different galaxies, we estimate. And God knows every one of them by name. Great is our God and of great power. His understanding is infinite. I hope we understand and appreciate that at least as far as we can. It's not the universe that is infinite. It is our God who is infinite. Bob Berman, an astronomer in the Journal of Astrology said, and he was talking about all the information that's written about the cosmos, about the universe. He said it ought to have this printed with it every time. Warning, the following contains contemporary cosmology Reading it can cause disorientation and confusion. Nobody knows what's going on, and nothing you read here is likely to be true. And that's because they just don't know. I understand that we continue to grow in knowledge, or at least I hope that we do as we go through our days. But I hope that also as we grow in knowledge and we learn things that maybe we didn't know before, it also reminds us that there is so much that we don't know. Someone puts on a white lab coat and they get their glasses out and they look like a scientist, like they've been in the lab all their life. People just believe whatever comes out of their mouth. What they really tell us is we, we don't know. We don't want to accept what you're telling us. But here's the best that we can offer. Well, let's look at what the evidence tells us. And again, there, there's some of these evidences that I don't understand fully. I, I am not a scientist. I, I don't spend a lot of time in science journals or that kind of thing. I'm fascinated by it. And I try to, to, to be a good observer and to learn. But I want to present these things to you. And hopefully, if you're interested, you'll study a little further about these things. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about them. But I think they're powerful in, in what they present. Now, before we get to them, I want to share this with you. How many of you have heard of Occam's razor before? A few of you. Okay. Here's what it is. It's just a principle. It's just an idea. But it's sound. It says, um, 
It's a problem-solving principle that the simplest solution tends to be the right one. When presented with competing hypotheses to solve a problem, one should select the solution with the fewest assumptions. The simplest answer is usually the right one. Not always. Understand that. But most of the time, it is. Because it deals with the difficulties. It presents an answer that's reasonable. Well, what about the universe? Occam's razor is going to be something that will show us that what the world says about this universe being 15 to 20 billion years old is filled with all kinds of problems. And you try to answer one and you've got to come up to a solution to this other. The simplest answer is that the evidence is showing us the universe isn't very old. It's not nearly as old as the world would have us to believe. So keep that in mind as we talk about some of these things. Here's the first thing I want to share with you. It's called the winding up dilemma. That's a picture of our Milky Way. And if you study this kind of thing, you might have recognized it. There are a lot of galaxies that, that look like this. They have a center, and then they have these spiral arms, you know, that are out. And it, it's a spinning. It, and of course, I'm sure you understand that we're all spinning. This universe is spinning. We're moving. Um, and here is this spiral galaxy. The center is moving much faster than those outer arms. Here's the dilemma. What we know from science is that if this universe has been here for millions and billions of years, those arms shouldn't be there anymore. What should happen in just a few million years is that everything kind of levels out. And you don't have those arms like that. Galaxies should appear like a blurred disk in just a few hundred million years. Now, again, I know that's a long period of time. Okay? And I don't believe the universe has been here that long. But in, if it's as old as what we're supposed to believe, these billions of years, we wouldn't have galaxies like this. Occam's razor tells us simplest solution is the universe isn't as old as you've been telling us. That's why we still have these spiral galaxies. It's a dilemma for the atheist. Here's number two, the conservation of angular momentum. And this really doesn't have to do with the age of the earth, but it does deal with our universe. And so I wanted to share this with us. But this idea, this principle, conservation of angular momentum, is just the idea that when there's an explosion or something is spinning, that those things will keep spinning in the same direction. Example, I've got five grandchildren. Suppose I put them on a merry-go-round. You know, they don't have them at many parks anymore. I, how are kids supposed to learn anything without any bumps or bruises? But, you know, you, you, you get on that and you spin that. And, of course, everybody just wants to go faster and faster and faster. And what happens eventually? If you're not strong enough or you don't have a good grip, you spin off. All right? Well, that happens. This thing's moving and people spin. But you know what? When they spin off, they don't go in opposite directions. They are all still going in that same direction. That's the idea with this conservation of angular momentum. Things ought to be spinning in the same direction. Here's the problem. In our solar system, Venus is spinning in the wrong direction. There are planets in our solar system, three of them in particular, that have moons that, have, that spin in opposite directions. Now you might expect some of that in the universe because of collisions, but not like this. And it's throughout the universe. They don't have a good answer for that. That Big Bang just, just, just doesn't work. But you won't hear things like that. 
presented by those who, who are trying to keep this away from you. Here's the next little bit of evidence I want to share with you. It's called the Pointing Robertson Effect. These are the two men, this is their last names, that noticed this effect. And it has to do with dust, solar dust. And what they noticed is that small pieces of dust, as they are around something as, as big as a planet or something with great mass, like our sun, they fall in to that planet. They're pulled in. That gravitational pull pulls them in. And in, again, just a, a few million years, all that dust should be pulled in. And really what should happen is in our solar system, shouldn't be any dust. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Now, I don't think it's talking about the kind of dusting we have to do, you know, from day to day or week to week, or whenever you do it, you know. Uh, whenever a company's coming or whatever. But, you know, that dust ought to be completely gone. Just a few million years. But here we are with all of this. It's supposed to be 15 to 20 billion years old. How can that be? Well, Occam, Occam's razor says, that just tells you the universe isn't as old as what we've been told. Here's another thought, and that is supernovas. These stars that explode. There's about four of them that happen every century, we're told. We've been able to see them and, and to be able to study them and notice how they expand. All this remnant, the cloud, how it expands. They're able to watch it with their telescopes. And they're able to make predictions about how things ought to go. There are these supernova remnants. And in 300 years of time, that cloud, that remnant of that explosion ought to go out, we're told, about 23 light years. Folks, when you start talking about light years, it goes far beyond my comprehension. I, I understand it's the principle of how far light can travel in a, in a, you know, in, in a year and that kind of thing, but I, I, that kind of distance... I just don't understand. I really don't. Not, not fully. But it just speaks to how vast our universe is. But in 300 years, that's what they say. 23 light years. 120,000 years, if you were given that much time, well, that supernova, the remnants, the expanse, would be 350 light years. Six million years, you would have an expanse of 1,500 light years. And that's what we ought to see in our universe because this has been going on supposedly for all this time. So we ought to see all this expanse. Well, what do we see? What we see in our universe is this. We see about 7,000 years worth of expansion. That's what you find. Telling us this universe isn't near as old is what we've been led to believe. It's also the case, as I mentioned, we have about four of these supernovas every year, or every hundred years. So if you have a million years, you ought to have about 7,291. But if you only have about 7,000 years of time, you have about 125. Well, how many do we see in our universe? Well, what we see is about 200. Which one's closer? What's the evidence telling us? Here's another thought for us from our universe. Short period comets. And I think this is fascinating. Uh, you know a comet, it, it, it has that, a tail to it. A comet is made up of, of dirt, rock, um, and, and ice. And what you see behind that comet, that tail, are pieces of it being taken off of that comet as it makes its orbit. Every time it gets close to the sun, a little bit more is taken away. So much so that we know 
that the lifespan or expectancy of comets is about 10,000 years. We still have comets, folks. We shouldn't if the universe has been here for 15, 20 billion years. There shouldn't be any more comets around. They should have been long gone. But we still got them. It's a real problem for the atheists, the evolutionists. And so they've come up with an answer. Someone thought maybe there is a place in the universe, we don't know about it, but it is spitting out these comets. We'll call it an Oort cloud. Oort's the fellow that came up with it. And so he, he, he hypothesized this idea of some kind of system that keeps making out these comets. That's why we still have them. Well, I thought this was interesting, but one of their own men said, folks, we ought not to be able to invoke the tooth fairy more than once. And they did that with the Big Bang. And so here, they create the, no evidence for it. In fact, what I'm told, again, I'm not a scientist, but what I'm told is it is theoretically impossible for something like this. And yet that's the best they can come up with for why we still have comets today. Occam's razor tells us they're here because the universe just isn't that old. That's why they're still around. I don't know if you noticed this today. I don't know if we can see the sun today, but it's shrinking. It's shrinking. Now, we'll never notice it. Never be able to see it with our eyes, but it is shrinking at five feet an hour. That, that, that's significant. Now, again, it's not going to affect us, but we know the sun is shrinking. Five feet an hour. Well, you know, one of the, the things that the evolutionist, the atheist, loves to count on is this idea of uniformitarianism. The present is the key to the past. Everything is just like it's always been. And so the way things go today, that's the way they were eons of time ago. Well, let's use that. If everything's been uniform and the sun is shrinking at five feet an hour, what happens if we go back a million years, a hundred million years, a billion years? Well, folks, you don't have to go very far until the sun is so big that earth couldn't be here. The evidence tells us we just haven't been here that long. Well, here's another point for us to think about, and that is Jupiter. Jupiter, our biggest planet, is still giving off twice as much heat as it is receiving from the sun. Jupiter has moons that you can see the volcanoes erupting on it. What that's telling us is Jupiter is still cooling down. That shouldn't be the case if this universe has been here for these billions of years. It should have been cooled off a long time ago, but it's still cooling down, giving off twice as much heat as it's receiving from the sun. Again, just another little evidence. And then there's a fellow by the name of Fred Hoyle. I put him on our paper. I don't have a slide for him up here, but he came up with this idea that most of the universe is made up of hydrogen and that hydrogen is co being converted to helium. Well, if the universe is billions of years old, then most of the universe ought to be made up of helium. It's not. It's still hydrogen. And I'm glad because if it was made up of helium, we'd all be talking in that voice, you know, when you swallow that balloon or whatever, you know, that air. Maybe not. But, again, it's another evidence for a young Earth, young universe. And then here's the last one I'll share with you. And that is the receding moon. Our moon is getting further and further away 
from the earth. Every year, it goes away by one and a half inches. Now, that's not very much. I know that. But again, if you take that backwards for millions of years, you get to a point where the moon and the earth are touching each other. And that's just in a few hundred million years. And besides that, there is something that is called the Loche Range. And I think it's about 11,000 miles. I, I'm not sure what it is. But this French scientist has proven that if the moon was any closer to the earth than that, it would be pulled apart by the earth's magnetic field. So we know it couldn't have been any closer to that to start with. According, and, but it's still moving. The moon ought to be a lot further away from us, according to the evolutionists, the atheists, than it is. Rocher's limit, 11,500 miles. So here is this evidence from our universe. There's more. There's more, and Lord willing, in a couple of weeks, we'll look at it. It'll be more having to do with the evidence here upon the earth. But this is all from the universe that we're looking at, and it all argues for a young universe, just like the Bible tells us. You, you won't be taught these things in school. You won't be hearing them on, on television. But the evidence is there. I hope you're curious enough to want to look. We mentioned tonight a Bible that was put out by Apologetics Press. Folks, I'd encourage you to go there and look at the material that they have online. Read some of these articles that talk about the very things we're talking about tonight. Examine the evidence further. Arm yourself for this battle that we're involved in. It's so important because, you see, folks, if I can't trust the Bible, when it comes to the first 11 chapters that tell us about how we got here, tell us about the flood, tell us about the languages, and so if I can't trust what the Bible says there, how can I trust anything else that it says? God's Word is right. It's right about creation. It's right about this universe, and it's certainly right about man and our great need to have the forgiveness of our sins. And we can only have that through our Creator, through Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in John chapter 1 that nothing was made without Him. And so I hope that this is a faith-building study for us and that it will help us to trust more and more in our Lord about all things, including the salvation of our souls. And tonight, if you're here and you're not yet a child of God, and you know you need to become one, we want to encourage you to take that step. As a penitent believer, confess Christ before men and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And if you're here as one who has obeyed, but you've fallen away and, and you need to come back, we want to pray with you and for you. We think about these things. And friend, if you need to respond, do that tonight as we stand and as we sing.